God has given us. Good to, it's good to be back here tonight for me. I know uh, some of you are thankful too. I hope everyone's thankful to be here. But uh, I, I'm very thankful to be in the house of God. I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve always. Uh, I need to be fed myself sometime <laughs> too. And uh, I just got a call yesterday, so Sunday I'm going to have to go as well. So y'all pray for me, <laughs> please, <laughs> because I'm needing that nourishment myself. I've seen some things lately, and God's been dealing with me some on some uh, issues lately in my life, in our relationship, of course. That was brought out last Friday night. And uh, somebody asked me today, are you and Tammy doing okay? And <laughs> I said, yeah, we're doing great. We're doing fine. God's just doing a work. We're just taking everything day by day, one day at a time. I mean, that's life, isn't it? Every day you have struggles in life and just issues with family and relationships and it's just how you respond to those uh, opposition or circumstances when you come against it and uh, the past month we just haven't really responded well <laughs> that's what's happened and now God has opened our eyes and especially mine I, I just have to speak for myself I can't speak for her I'd let her do that but you know God has opened my eyes and awareness of things that I have to take be taken care of or I have to allow God to, or yield my life in these certain areas of my life to the Lord and things I have held back or things I've just, you know, are holding on to. We'll just put it that way. Whatever terminology you want to use, there's just things that we're holding on to in life and we really need to let go of. And then there's things in life we need to, to grab hold of. You know, there's things of God. And I mean, knows that God has every good gift comes from above, right? I mean, God's got good things for us. He doesn't put things in our life to damage us and hurt us, or belittle us, or condemn us. Everything that God gives is for the edifying of our individual lives, our spirit. And how many would say tonight, as you turn to, if you want to, go ahead, turn to Isaiah 35. How many would agree that God desires our spirit, our souls, and our bodies, all three to be in line, to be in line with one another. In other words, to be whole, right? He wants our soul man, that seat of our will, minds, our emotions, and of course, is the body, the body carries out. He desires that to be under subjection and yielded to the spirit man, the regenerated man, the man where he speaks into our spirit, that spirit of truth. And where that is, when we bring everything else into subjection to that, and then it's lived out. And it's, uh, I think this is a recovery message. I, you know, we're a recovery church. We say that. I mean, I've heard that term thrown around. We're a recovery church. You know, we have a recovery group. And, uh, I'll just put it this way, as the brother said this past Saturday, we are all in recovery one way or the other. Whatever it is you're recovering from or getting back in your life, maybe it's joy or something like that. You know, um, in Isaiah, the 35th chapter, there was a particular verse the Lord just kept pounding into my spirit. But we're going to read, starting at verse 3, we're just going to read the rest of this chapter beginning of verse 3. There's particular two verses we'll be getting to later that really is the text today, but I just want to read this here if you would, and you can stand if you would like for the reading of God's Word. Isaiah 35, verses starting at verse 3. Now I'm going to be reading out of the modern English version, and he says, Strengthen the weak hands and support the feeble knees. And say to those who are a fearful heart, or yours may say a heart of anxiety or a heart of worry or troubled heart, whatever. Be strong and fear not. Your God will come with vengeance, even God with rep recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame man shall leap as a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For in the wilderness water shall break out. And streams in the desert, the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, a roadway, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. For the unclean shall not pass on it, but it shall be for the wayfaring man. And fools shall not wander on it. No lion shall be there, no ravenous beast shall go up on it. These shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the redeemed of the Lord, of the ransom of the Lord, shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. 
Thou shalt obtain joy and gladness and sorrow, and sighing shall flee away. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your promise. Your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. And Father, we just, I rely upon you, Holy Spirit, right now, because in myself, I don't have the clarity right now or the understanding, but Lord, I was just yielding and sensitive to your spirit for the clarity and bringing forth what you would want to bring forth tonight, Father. And we just give you the praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Philippians, the fourth chapter in the eighth and the ninth verse says this way. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. Do those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace. You might underline that right there. The God of peace shall be with you. How many wants the God of peace to reign and rule in your life? Amen. I think tonight we just need that more than anything. I want to talk here just for a moment. I was preaching this past Sunday about, um, it's out of Acts, the 27th chapter. And there was a word where um, Paul was in the midst of the storm. I've spoken on this subject quite a few times. And um, the word was the wind drove us. So the wind had driven us. And uh, I was starting thinking about the word driven. Driven. That means moved by or influenced by a specific person or thing or power, controlled by something. Or what are we driven by? Or what is influenced? Now, let me just say this. God does not control our lives. We'll say it this way. We are not a puppet. We're not puppets on a string. We're not robots being programmed. And God say, okay, you know, that, that's, that's the enemy. That's Satan. Now, Satan wants that. <laughs> but God desires for us to come individually and yield our hearts and lives because and motivated out of what? I said it last time. Love. Right? We can might say this message tonight is kind of a follow-through <laughs> because that's what the subject was last time. Follow-through on the message and how we follow through and without love, you know, love should motivate us and tonight we're going to be talking about love too or how love helps do something in our lives. It's through love, our love for God and his love for us. Okay, influence. What has influenced your life? Just, just think about that. Influence, again, it moves us. It, it drives us. I believe there's one word in the Greek where it means to carry somebody. Just think of how the Lord wants to carry us. He wants to lift us up. There's a scripture in there, I believe it was, where he lifts us up with his pinions as the eagle gets the bird and he carries him and he puts him in that place of safety. Just think of our lives tonight, yielded to the Lord and the Lord carrying us and moving us and, and helping us and strengthening us because something or someone has influenced us and still is influenced by something. I can say if I look back in my life, what influenced me the most? Well, of course, Jesus, the Word of God. I can say my pastor influenced me. I can say look at, uh, watching my mother uh, on her knees praying constantly. She was a prayer warrior. Uh, that really influenced my life in the Lord. Um, other than that, uh, Ronald Reagan was my big influence. And sincerely, I say that. Uh, I know there's politicians, and I'm not, I've never been a politician. But still, he influenced my life in a big way because, you see, I used to be a real shy person. <laughs> Can you believe that? And um, until probably about the ninth grade, tenth grade, I was real shy, wasn't I, David? I mean, my head would be this, barely lifted up, not talk to anyone or anything. Just bound by, really, I think literally bound by that. I think there was a spirit of fear, and we're going to get into that in my life and the Lord helped me with that and when I got into high school I did take a speech and drama class that really helped me to kind of open up and speak before people and uh, even as a teenager when I would see him speak on the television and he was known as the great communicator of course there, there was something would be drawn to him because he knew how to communicate his ideology or his thinking and get people behind that and, and, and still are today many people go to him for you know as a great influence in politics and things. But uh, what is really influencing our life today? That, I want to get it, draw it back in. Spiritually, what is influencing our life? 
What are we partaking of? Because here, here's the deal. We can reject and we can accept. Say every day, I was saying earlier, every day, it's one day at a time in relationship and just our walk with God. And every day, we're going to have to make choices because you're confronting things, you're confronting attitudes. Here, here's recovery because recovery is called what? Behavior modification. Yeah, so we're facing attitudes and behavior of other people that affects us. Have you ever heard the term, you drove me to blank? <laughs> Whatever it is. I heard my dad say that many times about my mom. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of anger and there was a lot of strife in our home. Hey, we were a Christian family. We really were. <laughs> you wouldn't know it by some of the attitudes. You wouldn't know it by the speech. But they did love Jesus. There was a lot of religion, but there was something driving us that wasn't the Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying here? See, Ephesians says it this way. Ephesians 5, 18 says, Be not drunk with wine, but be what? For, the, for that is reckless living, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the, Paul, Brother Paul has spoken on this before. Alcohol, influence. The Spirit of God, influence in our life. What do we need in our life more? Influence. What do we need to be driven by? We need to be driven by the, the Holy Spirit. That will change our behavior, change our speech. Uh, I wanted to really look at something concerning the heart. Because the heart is the center of man. The heart is where things we allow into our heart. And from that heart, in the scripture in Proverbs 4, 23, says from the heart, the issues of life are the issues of life. In other words, the message says it this way. It says that's where life starts. <laughs> it starts in the heart. So in other words, what, what's in the heart, the psalmist said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we want something in us that will help us, that will influence us where our behavior and our conduct and our words, in other words, bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we want, as a church and as believers, to influence a godless society. Amen? That's why we're called the church. We're to bring glory to him. It's not just to come together and have a good time, but it is to build one another up, to encourage one another, that that ministry of the Holy Spirit will manifest, that love, if you will, manifest itself through us into a godless culture and society and evil ideology that we can change. God will change. Now, let's understand this. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Amen. Everything that we need, everything God has that is good, a brother preached about courage here a couple weeks ago. We need courage. We do need courage. But you will not manufacture courage. You will not manufacture love. You will not manufacture anything that is Divine. In other words, it comes from God above. It is from the Spirit. Everything that you need, and when we get into these scriptures today, you're going to say, I can't do that. I can't do that. No, you can't do that. But God, through Christ, we can do all things. We can look at that scripture, what we just read there in Isaiah. We see some impossible, unorthodox things there. But God is a God of the impossible. He makes that which is impossible, possible. So in other words, God is turning, and God in his operation of his spirit, and he says, that wilderness or that dry land, that parched land, I will make it an oasis. So what I'm seeing here in my spirit, and what I'm hearing God say is, I want you to trust in me that I will do and I am bringing about great things in your life and I'm preparing you to walk into those great things. And, but you have to trust in me. If you don't trust in me, you're not going to get the benefits of the blessed life. We'll call it that way. Of this holy life. So we must guard our hearts. We said the heart is, is the seat. The heart is the center. How do we guard our hearts? Anybody? <laughs> well, number one would be guard your intake. Guard your intake. Think about that. Just as the body, right? The physical body needs nourishment. It needs the right kind of nourishment, Morris. I don't do that real well. 
Is it not interesting that the risk of heart disease for smokers is more than twice that of non-smokers? I'm not telling you, not, I'm not being legalistic here, okay? I'm, I'm just telling you, it's just facts, right? Same as for people who drink a lot of sodas, okay? The risk of heart disease, diabetes, everything else. Number two was, okay, let's go back there. Let's not get too carried away here. Intake. And just in our spiritual life, we need to take, partake of divine good things, spiritual nourishment, the word of God. That's why we come together. That's why instruction. That's why we pray. We need to get along with God. We need to let God speak to us, pour himself out into us. Number two would be exercise. Wow. I feel sometimes that I do enough of that at work. That's probably not true. Probably need to do a little more exercise. But we need to exercise our faith. Can y'all you know, hear me? We need to exercise our faith, truly. It's one thing to say we believe, next thing to do that. We need to exercise and trust in God. I want to look at a scripture real quick in Luke chapter 1. And I can summarize it really. And this is a verse of scripture we really don't go to this time of year. When you think of Luke, Luke chapter 1, what season would you usually hear a preacher, minister, teacher, what season would you hear that being talked about? Christmas, right. Okay. In Luke chapter 1, it really doesn't start with Mary and Joseph. It starts with Elizabeth and Zacharias. Zacharias was a priest. Okay, they had been praying for a child. Now, they, the word of God here says they were blameless, they were righteous, but they were barren. Now, that, back in that day, that was kind of a shameful thing to, for the woman to be barren. And uh, look at verse 8. It says, Now when he served as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense. And when he went up to the temple of the Lord, the whole crowd of people were praying outside the, at that hour of incense. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and, and fearful and fell upon and fear fell upon him. But the angel of the Lord said, Hey, don't fear. Don't fear, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your prayers have been heard. So, okay, him and Elizabeth had been praying, right? They've been trusting God, believing in God. You and your, and your, okay, you and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink but be filled with the Holy Spirit even from the mother's womb. He will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts and the fathers to the children and to the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, okay, but look at Zechariah here. Okay, here's his response. So this shows his heart. I could very well call this title, this message, instead of driven, prepare ye, or uh, what's the song in the Christmas song? Oh, prepare ye room. <laughs> it's about preparing a room for the Lord. And, and, you know, what are we allowing or what are we giving room to in our hearts? Because it, it shows right here what he, what he really did. Even though he prayed, did he believe? Well, his response is, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? I am old man and my wife well advanced in years. In other words, this ain't going to happen. Now, if an angel of God stood before us today and said that to whomever, would you really believe? And I think I would. I would probably be shaken and terrified just as well. But I would probably believe what he said. And I believe there's a real message in what God has been trying to speak to, to, to me personally. Is do you really trust me at my word? Do you really believe? Because this goes back to Acts 27th chapter again when the angel of the Lord came to Paul in the midst of that storm and says, you're going to get to your destination. You may not get there in one piece, but you're going to get there. In other words, no lives will be lost. And, and Paul's reply and Paul's response to, what, to this, when he declared this to the centurions or to the soldiers and to the prisoners was, I believe God. 
I believe God at his word. In other words, my heart has made room for, in other words, I'm hiding his word in my heart. I love how the message puts that version. He said, the message puts it this way. I, I, I've banked your word in my heart, or I've, I've invested my heart in it. It's like a vault my heart is, and your word is in that heart that I will not send myself bankrupt. Think about that. I don't want to live a life empty. I don't want to live a life not overflowing, not thriving, not flourishing, not giving. And how do I do that? How do I? I want to live a life that, and that, that's influenced by godly things, and I want to influence people in a godly way. And by doing that, I have to hide your word. In Psalms 33, it says it talks about the word of God, the power of God, how God does not trust in man's flesh or man's schemes, but God, but God through His word does things and creates things and, 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 and trust the men and those men who fear him and trust him. There's where the worship is. That is true worship, is trusting and fearing God. If we would trust and fear and love God and surrender our lives to God, there is nothing that we can't do because then it is God in us and God through us. Again, God wants our soul, our spirit, soul, and body to line up. How many have come into church and said, well, where there's two or three gathered, hey, there's just a few of us tonight, right? And the scripture says, where well, there's two or three gathered in his name, I'm in the midst. Okay. Now, right off the bat, you're saying, that means, okay, we come in here and say, in the name of Jesus. That's not what that scripture means. Now, anybody can come off the street and come in here and say, well, there's two or three of us in the name of Jesus. He's in the midst. No, he's not. No, he's not. No. What that means is I, you, and I, we must come in together into agreement with his will and his purpose. If I'm not in agreement with his will and purpose, then I'm not. We're, he's just not there. He's not in it. In other words, it's just me. It's just me manufacturing things. It's just me out of my effort. I don't want it. And that's where we're coming up short because it's people's efforts. It's the, the fleshly efforts. It's our wisdom. And God is saying, I want you to come into agreement with me, what I say. And, it, that was, and you may suffer and you may go through things and trials, but yet you will be blessed. There will be a, he just, we just read it in Isaiah 35. This is what I will do. This is what I can do. There's nothing impossible with me. See, why we don't do that, and I believe why we don't come into agreement, is because we are, come on, help me out. We're fearful. There's, there's, there's a kind of heart that we need to be. We need to be a thankful heart. We sang about it earlier. God, we need to have a heart that's full of gratitude. We need to have a heart that's full of thanksgiving, and it's worshiping God. We need to have a heart full of wisdom. Oh, I love this scripture. Proverbs chapter 2. Talking about prepare ye room. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 10 says this. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will persevere. Or per, excuse me, persevere. Preserve you. And understanding will keep you. To deliver you, come on, there's influence right there. That's godly influence. That's something moving us. It's not our power. It's not just trying to figure things out. It's when we line up with God's will and we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, and, uh, and open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. Zacharias did not open his heart to God at that moment. And he found himself mute for a while, did he not? Because of his unbelief. Fear and unbelief. Grace and mercy, they're twins. Fear and unbelief over here, they're pretty much twins too, aren't they? They're some nasty critters. And they do a lot of damage to a lot of hearts, and a lot of lives. When wisdom enters your heart, knowledge is, ple is pleasant to your soul. Discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of the evil man, from the man who speaks perverse things, to keep you, to help you. How many need godly influence in our lives today? How many want to be moved by a power? 
you're being moved by a power. One way or the other, the drug addict on the street is being influenced. I'll put it this way. I was at Telford last Tuesday night. We call it Terrible Telford. Of all the prisons that I go to, it's the one that I have feared the most <laughs> as far as being around. A lot of gangs there. I'm sure they're everywhere, but there. And there's a lot of different, uh, the ideology there, and there's a lot more openness of other things that I have never been around in my life, meaning um, homosexuality. I'll just put it that way, bluntly. They're very blunt. We're talking about men just sitting there with, okay, without being so graphic. It's there. They don't care. And I'm sitting there, and I'm standing before the service. I go, oh, God, how do you, how do you handle this? And Jesus says, hey, they're sick. I came for the sick. You're sick. We're all sick. I'm the physician. You just love them. I loved them. I didn't say condone it. I said love them. <laughs> okay? So here's where we have to have his love. This is where what should drive us in ministry, in life, should be motivated by love. Everything should be motivated by love. And perfect fear cast, or perfect fear, perfect love cast out fear. Ooh, it was hard. How y'all doing? Put my arm around. How you doing tonight? Good to have you here. Good to have you here. Praise God. That needs to be our attitude, because we're influenced by something greater. They're influenced by something evil and corrupt. We're influenced by something greater that can heal that, that can change that. I've heard testimonies of those who have been that, and they've been, their hearts have been changed. Their minds, look, people, it's a mindset. Think about it, your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's why he says, be, let your mind be renewed. Be not conformed, but be transformed. But it begins in the spirit. It begins right here in the heart. And when we get that changed, it affects, and we line everything else up. Fear seems to me, and this is where I want to get to verse 3 and 4 because this is the, really the meat of the scripture here that God really wanted me to proclaim tonight because it says, say, say to those. Strengthen the weak hands. Support the feeble knees. I was thinking about Nehemiah. When if you look at Nehemiah in Nehemiah 6, Nehemiah faces much resistance in his goal of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah had to stand against violent threats of the enemy in chapter 4. Chapter 5, he had to stand against internal conflict between the wealthy and the poor Jews. Now, we see in chapter 6, the work's just about finished. See, God's got a work for us, but there's always, always has and always will be resistance to the work. Whatever you're doing for the Lord, count on it. It's not going to stop. Now the doors of the gates, that's all's left, but the enemy is not giving up. In chapter 6, he hits him with four schemes. He hits him with intrigue. He hits him with the innuendo. He hits him with intimidation, and that's the one we're talking about tonight, intimidation or fear, because many times we give up because fear grips our heart. It's a spirit of fear, even though God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. He's given us a what? What's God giving you? Power? Sound mind. Yeah. False finish lines is what the enemy painted there. He's saying, quit, give up, stop now, come here, come with us, come talk with us. You've had enough, quit doing the work. But, but Nehemiah in his persistence, Nehemiah in his faith and his resolve, he says, I'm not coming down, I'm doing a great work. And that needs to be our pro proclamation tonight. We're doing a great work you go do your thing, but I'm doing mine for God. God's being glorified in me, and I'm not coming down. As believers that work are at chief priority in our life, first, and listen to this, the first priority is to glorify God by knowing Jesus Christ and being conformed to his character, beginning at the heart level. Anything that pulls us away from that is a ploy of the devil. Ministry itself. I was saying earlier how I needed nourishment myself. 
You know, ministry is a great thing. I am thankful because God had called me and God gifted me in certain areas. But still, my priority in my life and your life is to know the Lord and to love the Lord and have that relationship and fellowship with Him and let Him pour Himself out into me. Because if I'm not, if that relationship's not growing, this ministry over here is not going to grow. I'm not going to be able to pour myself out into others as I should, and especially the relationship and ministry in my home. Because that relationship, this ministry here, after God, is the most important ministry. Then there's the ministry of the church. Then there's the ministry of the streets. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. Oh, but then comes this. And here comes this to Nehemiah, these accusations. See, but how did he respond? How do we respond today? Come on, we're all facing it, or we will. Accusations of the past, or right now. What does he say in Nehemiah chapter, we'll just turn there and read it. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 8. This is his response. This is his response to the enemy. What's our response to the enemy? What's our response? Again, I said every day we have the responsibility to either reject or accept. We accept the things of God and we reject the enemy or we vice versa. Reject the enemy or accept the enemy and reject God. He says, I sent him this response saying, nothing like this reports that you're saying has occurred. From your, you're inventing them in your own mind because they all wanted to frighten us. They all wanted to bring fear into our hearts. They thought. They will pull their hands back from their work. In other words, this is what he's saying here. This is what you think. You're thinking we will frighten you. We will bring fear. And then you will stop the work. So now, but, but that would never be done. But here, here he goes. So now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Okay, here's his response to the enemy, but then he turns in prayer to go, God, oh God, that's an imperative verb right there, imperative. Oh God, God, I need you now to strengthen me. Yes, enemy, you're a liar, but God, I need your strength. Oh God, I need your mercy. Today, how desperate are we when he says here in Isaiah, strengthen the feeble hand. What do we do with our hands? The hands are for the work of God, are they not? The hands are for the worship of God. The hands are for receiving things. Because when the hands are down, I'm not receiving the things of God. I'm not doing the things of God. Strengthen the feeble knees. What are the knees doing? Well, we're walking that walk. Think of it naturally. Think of it spiritually. I'm walking. I'm praying. What does the enemy want us to do? Stop working for God. Stop receiving the things of God. Get fearful in your life. Get all worried. Get all anxiety. Get full of yourself. Get full of the world. And you'll stop praying. You'll stop believing. And you'll start thinking, nothing's, nothing is possible. Mm. I was reading this on Facebook. This young lady said, as far as I... For as long as I can remember, fear has been a strong grip on my heart. When I was a child, I feared just about everything. And I can testify to this. When I was talking about earlier, as a child growing up, and even as a teenager, fear gripped my life. It was fear. That's all it was. It was a spirit of fear. She says, I fear just about everything from water to dogs and all things in between. As an adult, well, I'm afraid that fear hasn't exactly diminished just matured to more realistic things. It keeps me up at night as countless what-if scenarios march their way through my thoughts. It rules my actions. Think about it. It rules my actions. In other words, something's controlling her. Something's influencing her. What's influencing our life? What's influencing our thoughts today? I've even have what I've dubbed as WCS condition, meaning that in perfectly ordinary and mundane situ situations, the worst case scenario flashes before my eyes, and I see these horrible outcomes that play out in my head. Wow. I can relate to that. I grew up in that. I grew up in a home like that. She knows my family members. I have a family member right now who has Alzheimer's. I'm not sure. I'm not going to say that's because. 
But growing up, all I ever heard was the worst case scenario come out of their mouth. I don't know if that affected the mind, but I believe fear, it affects us physically, mentally, emotionally. I mean, what we see on TV, what we see in society today, violence, abuse, being threatened, loss, loneliness, the fear of being alone, terrorism, depression, the fear that we'll never leave, the unknown. Medical doctors would admit that a large percentage of illness is caused by stress. Did you hear that? Fear can manifest itself. Seizures may occur with intense breathing difficulties, rapid heartbeat, uh, heartbeat outbreak of perspiration, shaking of hands. Mentally, thoughts can be marked by apprehension and confusion. All this brings about by fear. Emotionally, anxiety dominates so that underlying emotions, anger, self, doubt, various forms of anxiety is a significant emotion because it prevents us from venturing out in all sorts of dangers or purposeless, purposeless actions. And when I think about that again, I have to go back to my childhood and how I was affected. I was afraid to step out. I, was, I, I, was, I hated myself and I really didn't like anybody else around me because fear, I was captivated. I was in a prison, you see. But I came to know Jesus at an early age, 11 years of age, by the way. And I, I really did. I was saved and knew Jesus, but yet fear, I allowed fear. Never was taught about that. We were taught about gifts. Hey, all these are great. And other things, but look, we need to get down to the, to the root of things in our life, don't we? What's What's really happening in my life that's creating this behavior? We need to cut the root. Panic, anxiety attack, hypochondria, obsessive, compulsive disorder. I mean, we could go on and on. When God told Joshua, hey, you need to be courageous, he knew what he was talking about. Don't you think? When he's speaking to us tonight, when he's telling me, I want you to proclaim Say to these today, speak life into these individuals out here at New Beginnings today. Because speak, I'm speaking life into you. I don't want, tell them, you don't have to fear that I'm your defense. You don't have to have your head down. Praise God, I'm ready to pick you up. I'm ready to be the glory. I'm ready to be a shield about you, around you, beneath you, above you. And I want to be the glory and the lifter of your head, your source, your strength to lift you up from a despondent, depressed life that you can walk out and praise God be in, and be the greatest influence in Suffer Springs, Texas or in your job and your family that God created you to be tonight if we will yield to him. But you're going to face this Hittite. That's what he told Joshua and that's what God is telling us today. You're stepping into a land today but be strong and courageous, not in yourself. You may say, I can't do it. You know, you can't. But God can if we will receive tonight that spirit of love and let perfect love cast out all fear, we can defeat the Hittite. The Hittite is a descendant of Heth. It means to be shattered, be dismayed, be broken, be abolished, be afraid, to be afraid. In other words, you're facing terrorists. They were facing terrorists then. We're facing it today. I'm not talking about just in the natural. I'm talking about spiritual terrorists. How will we handle it. How will we handle it? This is how we handle it. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us spirit of fear, but, fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. God is your Father. He knows how to protect you. Romans 8, 15 says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage Hear that. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. We cry out, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. The glory, the lifter of our head. Psalms 3 and 3. Let me close with this. This is how the commentary puts it. Shield is a favorite and often used figure for protection. My glory is its source. The lifter of my head means one who raises me from despondency. 
David avows his confidence in God. Thou, O God, are a shield about me. The word in the original signifies more than a shield. It means a buckler, a roundabout, a protection which shall surround a man entirely. A shield above, beneath, around, without, and within. Oh, what a shield is God for his people. He wards off the fiery darts of Satan from beneath and the storms and trials from above, while at the same time, instant, he speaks peace into the tempest within the breast. Thou art my glory. God, David knew that though he was driven from his capital in contempt and scorn, he should yet return in triumph. Praise God. There's, there it is right there. You may be been, had been driven today by fear, but God says it's time for a return of my people. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal their land. God wants to heal our land today. There's fear in the land because that fear is bondage and that fear is hindering us from taking and occupying what God has already given us. See, that's what God was telling Israel to do, occupy. They never did, really. They really never did. They possessed in areas, but they never truly occupied because they allowed the enemy, many of the enemies, to still live beside them, abide alongside with them. No, sir. God's saying no. Me and me alone. It's time to drive out that spirit of fear, that spirit of bitterness, that spirit of hate, malice, strife, whatever it is tonight. We go in prayer, and we're going to pray over many needs, of course, and many lives as we get in groups and pray. As I said Friday night, God, the Lord said, my house shall be called a house of prayer but you've made it a den of thieves. See, we've given room to everything else. But the Lord says, to, I want the whole thing. <laughs> I want the whole thing. There's really just one room. And he says, I want to abide there. I want to reign there. That goes back to Philippians again, does it? The God of peace shall rule in your hearts, shall reign in your hearts. Praise God. That's what I desire tonight. May the God of peace reign in my heart. May the God of peace reign in my home. May the God of peace reign in my church. May the God of peace reign in my city here. You're the God of the city. And there is no God like our God. And he, that which is impossible with men, praise God, is not impossible with my God. And my God's going to make an oasis out of a desert. He's going to make a way. And we shall come forth in triumph. We shall come forth with joy, everlasting joy, because he is the lifter of our heads. He is the lifter. He is our encouragement. Amen. Praise God. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you, there again, aren't you thankful for what, who he is? Aren't you thankful how good God is? It's what he thinks of us. This is what he has for us. This is what the enemy's done to us. <laughs> but now God is saying it's time to break that chain, time to break that yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. I was talking about the anointing or the, the spirit of wisdom earlier, allowing the spirit. You know, there's seven, there's only one spirit, guys. <laughs> there's only one spirit. But there's seven administrations of the spirit if you look in Isaiah 11. Spirit of the Lord, the anointing of the, the sovereign Lord. Everyone's anointed. I don't believe there's different anointings. I believe there's different gifts, but I believe there's one anointing and God anoints you as much as he's anointed me. <laughs> He's just giving you different gifts, but he's anointed you. We have the spirit of the Lord. There's a spirit of wisdom. There's a spirit of knowledge. There's a spirit of strength. There's a spirit of counsel. <laughs> I believe it is, and I may be missing one there. Isaiah, the 11th chapter, you'll find it. Praise God. Ask him for those things. Ask him, Lord God, Holy Spirit, to operate in my life with a spirit of understanding, spirit of wisdom, spirit of counsel. Praise God. Well, Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the spirit of love and perfect love cast out all fear. There is no bondage. There is no fear in love. So let everything that drives us and influences us in every way and aspect of our lives be from the love of God. May our hearts be pure and changed, Lord, by your sweet spirit. And we just give you all praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God as we break up in groups, uh, Sister Peggy. Somebody said earlier she's doing well, and I saw that on Facebook. She was.
So uh, continue to pray for her, though. Anyone else? Your dad, of course, Brother Doug White. Anyone else? I don't see a list here. That's why I'm saying anyone else. Donna Edgar got to come home, okay. How's Brother Jay doing?